Hey, Justin, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me uh, on your show. My pleasure. Tell us where you're zooming in from. I'm calling all the way from San Bernard, British Columbia, Canada. Cool. That's far west, correct? Yeah, it's about five hours from Vancouver. If anybody doesn't know their geography of Canada, I'm right near the, the Pacific Ocean. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming in today to talk with us. And can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Well, my name is Justin Bryan. I'm a mental health advocate. I'm a speaker, a transformational coach, and I'm an author now of an Amazon bestseller, Chasing Shadows, Fighting the Monster Within. So, Congratulations on that. Yeah, thank you very much. It was... Uh, you know, it was a long time coming. I did, you know, if you were to tell me I was going to write a book, I wouldn't have believed you. But I definitely wouldn't have believed that I would have written a book on the topic of mental health, substance use, suicide, you know, personal development and learning lessons. You know, I took a quick peek at your website. And when I say I took a quick peek, I mean, I cyber stopped you because that's what I do. <laughs> Fair enough. And you have a lot of tremendous programs. You've helped a lot of people you've spoken at a lot of events you travel around and speak to schools and all that but it didn't start there you have quite a story about how you got where you were yeah no it was uh it's been quite the journey one that um i i believe i'm blessed to have you know i wouldn't change any of it i would definitely change some of the decisions and actions that i've made for sure however you know i wouldn't change any of those dark days lonely nights because now I get to do what I get to do. Um, and that's serving other people. It's helping people who have passed their, you know, suffering beliefs and really creating that imagined future that they want, but also allowing them to do it themselves, finding within themselves and take that direction a little further. I also get to help people with their mental health. I'm not a counselor, but I can teach them coping mechanisms that there's more to life than just being sad all the time, you know, mm -hmm. that there is help out there and that they're all lower. My journey started off as a kid. I battled self-esteem, self-worth, self-confidence, and I didn't know what those things were back then, right? I was young. Um, you know, I had a family that loved me. I was athletic. I had people that liked me, but, you know, I didn't like, I was always comparing myself to other people. And I, you know, I wanted to be everybody else but me. You know, I, I grew later than everybody else. And uh, that, uh, so I was smaller than everybody. And that was a little tough for me. Um, actually, at one point, I would phone my buddy and his mom would ask his phone and be like, Calvin said, I'm just a girl on the phone. He'd be like, I can hear you. Or I can hear you. I can or I say, yeah, I'm not here. <laughs> but I didn't. She started to get down on my knees and I prayed to be bigger. I prayed to be stronger. I prayed to be faster. But I also prayed to be normal. And I prayed to be normal because I didn't know what to do with those insecurities that I had. So what did I do with those insecurities? Well, I grabbed an imaginary bag and I put in that low self-esteem, low self-worth, low self-confidence. And I zipped it back up and I put it on my back and I went through GI school, through elementary, sorry, in high school. And when that bag started to get heavy, I took it off and I opened it up. But instead of unpacking that, I started to put guilt, shame, anger, depression, suicide, drugs, and alcohol into that bag and I put it on my back and I just kept on walking. I... By the time I was 21, I was drinking almost every single day. And uh, by the time I was 24, I was, yeah, I was basically a full-blown alcoholic. Where one time I had a bartender come up to me and ask me, he says, Justin, do you think you drink too much? And I looked at him and I brushed him off because I didn't listen to anybody. And I said, there's no way I drink too much. You know, I'm young. I like to have fun. I mean, this big, beautiful city at that time, I was living in Vancouver. Right? And it's, it's right on the ocean. There's a map. There's amazing night lights there right now i'm a young kid i'm 24 years old living the life there's no way i drink too much so i did what i did every single night i would i close up that bar within 15 20 minutes i got out for power half hour power hour got as drunk as i could at the, at the club you know started walking home and on the way home i'd always phone up dial a bottle so i can have more alcohol delivered to my house when i got there 
with this sign, as I was walking across Camry Street Bridge in Vancouver, a thought rings through my head and it was his voice saying, Justin, you drink too much. And I stopped and I'm like, there's no way I drink too much. I'm young, I like to have fun. I'm in this big, beautiful city and I'm a bartender. So I did normalize it. Yeah, I, absolutely. And you know, that's what people do with alcohol and substances is they find reasons to drink, reasons to not give up drinking or using the substance. So I ended up taking a couple more steps and then my voice rang through my head. It says, Justin, are you an alcoholic? Well, I actually said this word for word. There's no way I'm an alcoholic. I go to work. I pay my bills. I'm not a low life and I am too smart to be an alcoholic. Okay. I was so smart. In fact, that I graduated that year from alcohol abuse to drug abuse. At 24 years old, I did cocaine for the very first time and I didn't remember doing it. So I phoned up my buddy. He told me what happened. I was like, oh man. Okay. And then said something to me that you probably shouldn't say to a person with my mindset. And he was like, man, you were funny last night. Mm -hmm. Well, right. None of their clips. You know, I have alcohol for confidence. I have drugs to be funny. You know, I got this super special power now that I just have one shot of this and one shot of that. And then I'm super Justin, right? Well, I can tell you, I was the only one that thought I was super Justin. You fast forward six months down the road, I end up moving back home to Salmon Arm, a small community, and uh, I start managing the nightclub. And I had to get a ride home one night because I lost my license for drinking and driving. And on the way home, me and my buddy started talking about the topic of depression to where I looked at him and I said this, depression's for the week. Depression is an excuse. You got to man up, you gotta go to work, and you got to pay your bills. Now, I don't know why I said it back then, but I definitely know why I said it now is because I was trying to look stronger on the outside than when I was trying to, what I felt on the inside, because I still have that feeling of less than. So now at 24 years old, I have two major problems. I have substance abuse and my mental health. At 24 years old, I'm ignoring two major problems, my substance abuse and my mental health. And I took that with me until about four years later, when I was 28 years old, finally admitted to myself, okay, Justin, you need help. You are depressed. You abuse substances, drugs, and alcohol, so you need to get help. So 20 and I finally asked for help. But when I asked for help, it actually be the start of my suicidal thoughts for six years. How does six years every day I would ask myself, Justin, are you going to make it, man? Like, are you going to make it to see your son you know, score his first goal in hockey? Are you going to make it to see him graduate? Are you going to make it to teach him how to ride a bike? And the answer, inevitably, every single time was no. You know, I couldn't picture myself in his future. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't. Picture that because of the way I felt and the way I just, I kept using every time I tried to quit. Now, when I had my son, I just got out of rehab. I, and I was clean for about two months and then I started drinking again. And then six months after that, my girlfriend had to make the toughest decision of her life for only pick up my son and leave me at my lowest point. So here I had my, I only got to see my son twice a week for four hours at a time for a court order and I couldn't drive with him um, in my car. So my, I just started to deteriorate, you know, I was just messing up life. I was on a leave of absence from work. So my suicidal thoughts started to get more and more and more to where I actually thought he would be better off without me. So I ended up becoming an organ donor, getting milk thistle from my liver and kidney flush because I was actually preparing my body to, you know, give to someone that I thought I believe truly deserved it. I'm like, well, Justin, you're smart, athletic, funny, people like you. You're wasting your talent, just wasting away. And there's someone out there that can really use our, really use a set of lungs. Wow. Plus getting ready to, to donate my body. You know, around that time, I started to listen to motivational speaking and can we all these speakers. There? Sorry. Can we yeah, there? Real quick to think that your body, the embodiment of your own spirit would be better off with someone else than yourself that you couldn't see you were a viable recipient of that that is a a big big red flag a big point in your life a big low point yeah it was it was you know i remember walking into the dmv to that's where you had to become an organ donor um mm -hmm. and looking at the lady and saying oh, i want to be an organ donor and she just had a smile on her face she's like oh good for you you know, it's really good to hear. And I'm just sitting there thinking, I'm like, if you only really knew. Yeah. And then I just walked out. And it's just, that's how I truly felt about myself. I thought I was wasting my God-given talent. 
what God gave me. I thought I was wasting it. So finally, I actually started listening to motivational speaking and it started talking about find your why, find your why. So I started to ask myself, Justin, well, what is your why? What is your why that's going to drive you and motivate you to get better? What is your why that's going to pick you up when you fall down? So I started to reframe my thoughts and look at that little boy again. I saw, okay, well, instead of, you know, ending it so he's a better dad, well, what if I be, got better so I could become that dad? You know, if I get better for him, I get better for me. And if I get better for me, I actually help other people. So with that, I made my son my why. I made him my anchor. Now, a lot of people are going to say, hey, you know, you got to do it for yourself. Yeah, well, yes, you should do it for yourself. However, for a lot of guys that I went to rehab with, people like me, myself included, we couldn't do it for ourselves. So we had to find a reason, right? And my reason was my son. Now, the thing about that is, is when you, I made my son my why, it still came back on me. I got better for him, but I got ultimately better for me. That was a whole man goal. So whatever you get better for, it's going to come back on you. Now it's better when you can do it for yourself. Now I can do it for myself. Now I can see that I'm worth it, right? So I can do that for myself. But with that, I went back to rehab again and I did all my stuff, did courses and they started to teach us things like gratitude, um, do, reminding yourself what you're grateful for every day, you know, doing it consistently, journaling, getting your thoughts out of your head and onto paper. But one of the biggest things I learned besides, you know, diet and exercise is the power of acceptance and forgiveness. How uh, acceptance and forgiveness is actually for you. Now, there are going to be times in your life where people are going to hurt you. An event is going to happen. Maybe someone passes away unexpectedly and you actually might even be mad at God, right? And it's hard to get past that. But the way to get past it is you have to accept it. And you have to accept it because it truly happened. Now, that doesn't mean you don't have to like it, but you have to accept it so you can forgive it. And you have to forgive it so you can move on. Now, when it comes to the people that hurt you, you don't have to forgive them to their face. You don't, they don't even have to know about it. But we did a visualization thing in rehab where we sat down, closed our eyes, and our instructor talked, and he had picture someone that hurt you. You know, talk to them, right? For tell them how they hurt you. Now we forgive them. And I actually started to cry, right? Okay. And that really helped. And I had to realize during that conversation that I was having in my head, in that visualization, that I was to blame too. I, I had a friend tell me that you were 100% responsible for 50% of your relationships. So I started to realize, you know, I'm putting all this anger towards that person. And I'm not taking responsibility for my part of it. Right? Were you able to forgive yourself then? I have, yeah, and it, it was about eight months ago to completely accept yeah. and forgive myself. It, it, it's been a process of accepting some of the things I've done, but to completely forgive myself, it was probably about eight months ago. So Maybe. it's been quite a journey then. Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, and so that's one of the things I was just going to say is that there's going to be times in your life where that thing that you're going to have to accept is something you did. And that person you're gonna have to forgive is yourself. And for me, that was the longest, longest part of it was, it was forgiving myself and realizing, you know, I'm not perfect. Nobody will ever be perfect. I'm a human, but I made mistakes. Now I can hope others forgive me as well, but it took me quite a while to do that as well. Um, but then I got out of rehab and I started working again and I was doing good, but then two months later, the pink cloud hits and it's, I stopped doing my coping mechanism. I've stopped going to counseling. I'm going to stop taking my medication. All of a sudden one day I had my son and I was like, okay, I gave him to my mom. I'm like, mom, I, I can't right now. I couldn't deal with them. Even though he was just sitting there, mm -hmm. he was just sitting there quiet. We were watching a movie, but my thoughts, I couldn't, um, contain them there. I was, I was mad. I was irritable. I was angry. I was depressed. I was lonely. I was suicidal. Now, when you don't get help for your mental health, you're going to have a hard time regulating your emotions, right? And you're going to go through this plethora of feelings and you're not going to be able to control it. You're going to be angry. Then all of a sudden you can be sad. Then you can be mad. Then you can be happy, right? So I couldn't deal with it. So I gave it to my son and I started drinking again. And finally, 
on January 1st, I don't remember doing this. I quit my job. I phoned my boss. I don't remember. I was drunk in the morning and I quit my job. And then it came to, I'm like, oh man. So I was like, you know what, whatever, just keep drinking. And then I woke up, I came to on the morning of January 4th, 2019. And I'm sitting in my basement suite alone. I'm looking around at uh, the picture of my kid on my, on TV stands and all that. I'm looking at his toys and I'm looking at his hockey stick in the left. And I'm just like, Justin, you have two choices. You can get help or you can end it. And one of the things that I started to picture was my son growing up without his biological father and being teased. And I know that's, you know, might sound weird for other people, but for me, that kind of, that that's what I had to do. Right. So I phoned my mom and I got her to come pick me up. I said, mom, you need to take me to the hospital. With that, she took me to the hospital and with my dad to my left of me and my mom in front of me and counselor to my right, I finally admitted those words out loud that if I was going to continue to feel the way that I did, that I had a plan and that plan was to end it. And once I said that, that weight got lifted off my shoulders and 50% of it anyways, not all of it, but it felt great to say that. And they let me go home with my mom that day because I was living underneath her. And from that day on, I've been sober ever since. I'm almost coming up on my five year anniversary. Um, I went back to school to be a speaker, to be a coach, to help people with, you know, mental health. Um, no, not the, in the counseling realm, but I also go back together with my ex three years after, and we have a beautiful baby girl now too. And I got to see my son score his first goal in hockey. Awesome. Awesome. And I bet he looked up at his dad when he did. He was pretty pumped. Yeah. Ugh. So, Justin, you were sitting there with your son watching this movie and all of these things were going through your mind. It was a really dark point for you with your mental health. And I can't help but think, man, and your why is right there next to you. And it's just magnifying all of those things. How can you have those feelings and be sitting right next to your why? There's no question you had to find a way out of that for a moment. That would have been tremendous pressure for you. Yeah, it, it was tough. It's, I stopped doing my coping mechanisms, right? Mm -hmm. I stopped getting the help that I needed. You know, depression isn't your, or your mental health isn't a one-way street, you know, uh, what is it? No Spencer. He said, oh, I forget that quote he has, but it's something like it's, it's not about the destination. It's about how you drive. Mm -hmm. Right. I know I'll, I still struggle with anxiety a bit. You know, I can still get sad and knocked down and can, right. But I still have a counselor and mm -hmm. I, I reach out my hand when I need to. But at that point, I stopped seeing a counselor. I stopped taking my medication. I stopped my journaling. I, I stopped doing everything that I needed to do. And I didn't remind myself of my why. I thought I went, got back in the, that mindset again of, you know what, maybe he's better off without me. He's better off without me. Even though I am, he is the reason I should be alive. I went back and got that negative internal dialogue again. I started to believe the things that I was telling myself, you know, that your internal dialogue can make or break you. I mean, you, and the thing about that is, is that your thoughts are facts, right? But we can tend to believe them, even if we know they're not true. So we got to question those thoughts. Hey, is this true? Is it absolutely true? You know, how would I feel if I didn't have that thought? My friend had that thought. What would I say to them? Could I say it to myself? But I couldn't decipher that. I just believe everything I said about myself and I would actually, I would, I would implant a conversation into a friend's head of mine of what they thought about. I know exactly what you're saying. And I think a lot of people might understand that too. Yeah. They have well, no idea that they had this conversation with you, but you had yeah. the full conversation with them in your head. How often have you been sitting at home and you're, you're, you may be disappointed in yourself. So you're like, oh, well, that person's probably disappointing you. And now all of a sudden you're having a, this imaginary conversation with how they feel about your actions 
to what you're doing in life. And then I started to do that. So I'm like, well, then it must be true. Even though nothing was said, we turn our thoughts into beliefs and then our beliefs become our truths and then our truths start to control our actions. So then I started to drink again because that was my peace. That was my solace. That was my escape. That was the way that I found love. Can you tell us about the moment when you finally forgave yourself? Well, that was after a counseling session. And he's just like, can you do anything about it? And then we had a conversation like with somebody sitting in a, imagine a person sitting in a chair and I just like, you know, those times it just clicks. Yeah. It's just like, okay, there's nothing I can do. And now I don't necessarily like it when people say, Hey, that, that wasn't me because it was you, but it's a version of you that doesn't exist anymore. And that was a version of me that didn't exist. And it was an intoxicated version of me. And this, so I don't ever say that, you know, that wasn't me because it was me. I did it, but I know that in different circumstances, it would have been different. Some of the things that I've done and there's only way that I'm going to be able to live a life I want to live. Um, I'm going to have to fully accept and forgive myself and then hope that other people do as well. And it kind of felt like a, uh, a weight was lifted off my shoulders. Well, the truth of it is, as broken as that person was, as deep in darkness as that person was, that person still made choices that got you through to where you are today. Yeah, and I'm sorry, and I wouldn't, like I said, I wouldn't change the dark days or lonely nights because I actually, it made me who the way I am today and helps me to do what I do. I think with people that struggle with forgiving themselves, um, it's hard to see that that person that they forgave, that past version of themselves, did the best they could in the circumstances they had, and it got them to where they are now. And it's time to say, thanks, but I'm going to take the wheel now. And to see you do that and to show such the phrase courageous vulnerability keeps coming to my mind as I talk to you, because first of all, thank you for being so vulnerable with us. And it's courageous and that courageous vulnerability, not only to share your story here, but also within yourself and to look at it and to sit with it. That's powerful. And I think that it's going to help so many people. It obviously already has. But for the person listening to this today, you can be courageously vulnerable too. And if you don't think so, you know, reach out to Justin, have a conversation. There's a link to his website in the show notes. Click it, see his story, connect with him. There's scroll down the page at the bottom. There's a big old button that says, reach out to me. So do it. Justin, I bet you would uh, have a big old bunch of grace or the person that reaches out to you in that way. Absolutely. And, you know, I had somebody, who had me to post today about my failures. I, I, I am a failure because I have failed at a million things. And I've listed a lot of my failures and then some, and what I learned in a friend's life. So I was like, well, I'm really happy to see how you can speak like that and be so vulnerable. It's because I hid from vulnerability for so long that it tore me up. Being vulnerable not only helps me, helps people see who I really am, but it can help others be like, okay, well, maybe I don't have to hide anymore. You know, maybe I can get rid of that man up stigma. You know, like, what does that even mean? Come on up. What does it mean? Instead of saying man up, they're like, ask for help or, hey, I'm here. I'm listening. And hopefully it can help encourage other people to you know, reach out for help. So if I can do anything with my life, I hope it's encourage and empower people to reach out and just live better lives and realize that they're not alone. Justin, I would say the depth of our relationship has lasted, what, an hour or maybe in the times that we've spent speaking with each other, texting or emailing and in that time, I can say you've had a profound effect on me, a positive effect. 
that your courageous vulnerability just shines through. And if someone can be impactful in that amount of time, boy, you can do a whole lot. And I'm so glad you're here on this planet and walking this life and this earth and sharing the gifts that you had. I'm glad you donated your organs to yourself. And I think you're the best donor and the best recipient. Well, I, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. It's, it's a humbling feeling and I'm, I'm glad that I can impact you in, in, a, in, a, in a good way because, you know, I never would have thought that what I'm doing was possible. I didn't think I'd make it this far. I didn't, definitely didn't think what I would, it's, it's so weird seeing people all, like, I just, I go and be vulnerable on a post and then try to put a learning lesson at the end and people say, oh, you're so inspiring. And it's, it's still, I, I don't even know if it fully resonates with me. Um, because I'm just trying to be me, right? Because I hid from me for so long. But if I can be my best me, that someone else can be their best them. Tell us the name of your book again. Uh, so it's called Chasing Shadows, Fighting the Monster Within. It's a, a, an in-depth look at my life. It's, it talks about suicide. It talks about the things that I've done to myself. It talks about the struggles that I've gone through, the things that I've witnessed um, in more detail. It's broken into three parts during alcohol, after alcohol, and then learning lessons. Um, it talks about the comebacks. Also talks about but how to make change. You know, the heat difference in your human needs and how I took a Tony Robbins course. And that the six human needs, if one thing can meet well, four of those needs, that it may become an addiction for you. And that alcohol did that. It gave me so much. And I talked about it yesterday in a post that says addiction. Let me, sorry, I'm just going to look it up real quick here. Um, addiction is giving up everything for one thing, but recovery is giving up one thing for everything. And alcohol, I thought gave me everything. I thought it made me happy. It gave me this. It gave me that. It gave me comfort. But giving it up, you know, gave me my life, gave me my family. But I didn't just give up alcohol. I still did the work, did the counseling, did the medications. Uh, I'm not on medication anymore, but I still did all those until I, I was comfortable enough to get off the medication because it literally helped me to learn all those things, keep my mind in, in a healthier spot so I could learn the natural way of doing it as well. Well, Justin, thank you so much for being here today. I appreciate that. Thank you very much.